Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show here on STV2. The main talking points on tonight's programme. Craig Levine and Austin McPhee escape further punishment. Can Celtic finish off Anderlecht in their final Champions League tie? Graham Murphy takes training as the Rangers manager search drags on. Yeah, just a few of the talking points. Alan Ruff will be discussing with me, Peter Martin, and I'm delighted to say our boot room guest tonight is a tough tackling midfielder for Celtic, Borussia Dortmund, Hibernian. Let's not forget Dumbarton in case anybody gets uh, well peeved. And of course, a Scotland international as well, Murdo McLeod. Delighted to have Murdo uh, back with us. Ruffy, of course, always good to, to get a legend in on the programme, is that fair comment? Yeah, I would say so. I said that that era, you know, to be at a club for that long, I would say he would certainly be up there. Yeah, OK. <laughs> That's Ruffy's way of saying, I'm not sure if you yeah. are, but you're up there. Uh, anyway, uh, lots to talk about, of course, um, not too far away from kick-off. Uh, Celtic against Anderlecht. The place will be absolutely bouncing ahead of this one because the remit was quite simple, Murdo. Um, make it into European football after Christmas and I think tonight they've got the perfect opportunity to achieve that. Yeah, they've worked really hard, the, the team, especially getting that victory away from home, winning 3-0 out there. But I think when you look at the last two seasons, you know, the Champions League was really tough last, uh, last season with the... Uh, Barcelona involved and Man City in there and uh, München Gladbach but I think Anderlecht were always going to be the team that Celtic could win home and away against and they've managed to do that away from home and I think for the game tonight it's the job's done already Yeah, I mean even when you uh, listen to some of the Anderlecht players and the manager and uh, now it's it's a tall order I don't even think in their heart of hearts they, mm -hmm. they reckon a Belgian side can come to Glasgow and overturn that three goals Ruffy No I would like to think so you know as, as Murdo said there I think Celtic went over there uh, and did the job I think we all thought they were going to go over there maybe one each yeah. or, or maybe no, just keep it tight, you know, but they over there and convincingly got the result that takes them through because I don't think Anderlecht, although they have improved, are good enough to go out and beat Celtic 3 or 4 nothing. Yeah, well, let's have a look at the back pages of the morning newspapers to see uh, what's dominating, obviously, Champions League at the forefront of uh, many of the papers and one of them just uh, hailing Scott Brown because uh, tonight, when he takes to the field, he will eclipse the achievements of Kenny Dalglish with his 69th uh, European Cup game and also uh, D-Day for Gers uh, with McInnes move and of course developments undoubtedly later on uh, tonight and tomorrow on uh, Rangers and whether they do make that concrete offer to Aberdeen for Derek McInnes and whether it's accepted uh, shows the money and the uh, suggestion is that Aberdeen want £800,000 up front before Derek McInnes can even start thinking about talking to Rangers about what's on offer. We'll discuss that a little later on in the programme as well. But uh, all roads lead to Celtic Park for Celtic's final Champions League tie. Certainly, the result out there and the performance, we were, uh, we played very well. Uh, Anderlecht will obviously be disappointed, having been at home, and uh, and obviously us coming to them and, and winning, you know, quite convincingly. But in the home games, we have uh, apparently more difficulty to to score, and uh, we're playing away, so maybe that's. Uh, for us, uh, favourable to be able to score maybe easier. What we showed are different elements to our game. We had the good possession in our game out there. We uh, we showed creativity on the ball and our counter-attack was very good, but ultimately we defended it very, very well. A strong team, certainly at home, even if they won 0-3 in Anderlecht. Uh, I still believe that this team is, is, is much stronger at home with the public behind them than in the away game. So. It stays a very difficult task for uh, for any team. We want to give the supporters a yeah, Champions League victory at home. You know, we, we've been in two campaigns now. This being the last game of the, the Champions League campaign, it's been absolutely brilliant. The supporters have been incredible for us coming away. But it'd be nice for us to uh, to finish this campaign with a victory at home. We're going to come on the pitch. There will be noise all over. The crowd will put them uh, behind the team. They will uh, fly like hell on the pitch, so we're going to have to be ready. 
they change the coach, so um, they'll look at that as a you know as a positive. You know, we've watched a number of their games and uh, they play quite well. So, uh, so they'll come to to attack, I'm sure, and and look to get a victory. If we survive, and we can manage to to get to, to pull the things level, then maybe we we stand a chance to do something. This game, we have to be tactically ready and prepared, and um, and like I said, looked upon a good performance. And we know if we can do that, then that can equate to a good result for ourselves. Yep, um, this is a uh, Celtic side fairly confident that they can do the business. Uh, Belgian sides don't have a good record coming mm. to uh, Glasgow at the best of times. And despite the fact they've changed manager, they got a 2-1 win at the weekend against Locker and Murdo, but um, they're a wee bit off the pace in the Belgian league at the moment. Yeah, sitting third just now, Peter. So I don't think they're going to be a, a top side coming to Celtic Park. And I think listening to the manager there, I don't know whether it's all tongue-in-cheek. They're saying we've a little chance and maybe they scored the first goal. But I just think Celtic... We change at the weekend as well. Six changes in the, the team. I think this side tonight will be so, far too strong for Anderlecht. And I think Celtic will be very comfortable tonight. Yeah, um, interestingly enough, I want to get your thoughts on this man because the captain of Celtic makes his 69th European appearance. He's in great company with Kenny. Kenny, obviously, a, you know, a real legend here of the club and at, and at Liverpool also. Um, so I think it, it, it tells you the... The mark of his consistency, Brownies, you know, to have played the number of games and been available and been chosen for those games by various managers shows you the the level that he's played at. So, um, see, of course, he, he captains the team. Now it's a great accolade for him, and and hopefully he's got many more ahead of him. Yep, no mean feat for Scott Brown. I mean, in the early days, he he was a divisive character with a lot yeah. of Celtic fans, but. He's more mature. He's certainly, uh, you know, a key figure for Celtic. Yeah, I think, uh, especially over the last couple of seasons. I think before Brendan arrived, I think Bruni himself thought maybe time to move on because of his injuries, because of what was happening on the pitch. But since Brendan's arrived, he's given him a new lease of life, and now he's setting more and more records. Uh, he's been playing at a, a great level, Scott Brown, and he's a leader of the team. And I think that's one thing Celtic would need to look at. Even for next season, if Scott Brown at any point is not in the team, then they need someone else to, to start shouting the orders out in the pitch because he's very aggressive to his own players when they make mistakes and when Brown's not on the pitch, that doesn't happen. I, I'll get your thoughts in a minute, Ruffy, o, o, on this, but let, let me suggest to you as the type of midfielder that you were, um, I still think when Brendan looks towards the signings in the January transfer window, he's got to look for centre-half, which I think he's made abundantly yeah. clear to everyone. I still think Celtic lack a number 10. You know, people are talking about Rogic could be a number 10. Uh, you know, maybe others <coughs> are, uh, on the bench. Yeah. I don't see a number 10 in there, but I, I do see a, a Brown and whoever the other holding midfielder yeah. would be far more effective for me if they had that classic number 10. What's your yeah. take on it? Well, if you have a number 10, Scott Brown can play there all day long, just sitting in front of the two centre-backs. Um, but you, you've got to pay a lot of money now, I think, Peter, to, to get a, a proper number 10, someone that can go and dominate the game and make passes, create goals, make goals, score goals. And I think when you get someone of that ilk, it takes you up to the next level. Yeah, I mean... Uh... I mean, I look at the side that you actually uh, were part of with Vim Janssen, um, you know, that stopped uh, 10 in a row. You had the classic in Paul Lambert, who, yeah. who gave you that perfect holding midfielder. Yeah, well, you, you had uh, Lambert sitting there all day long, taking the ball off everyone. It was fantastic. But again, he was a wee bit more forward thinking. You no, know, he, he was quite comfortable running 10, 15 yards of the ball, playing a pass, getting it again, and moving forward. You had Burley in there as well. We had uh, you no know, great strength in there. Bully would nick a, a lot of goals for us as yeah. well. And then you had players going down the sides, McNamara going down the sides, and Reggie Blinker was there down the, the left hand side. Phil Adonno was in the side. You know, we had so many top class players, and they're just uh, wonderful to work with them all. I just wonder where uh, Scott Brown's place is in the history of uh, Celtic. It's a, it's a tough one to call because sometimes I think, unfairly, uh, Ruffy, he's uh, measured against 
players who are a slightly different style in the middle of the park. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't take anything away from the last two or three years. You know, to play that number of games is, is fantastic. And as Murdo said there, he's a leader. He's a sort of a Roy Keane, you know, totally focused. And then everybody else focuses in with him. And they all yeah. up their game when he's on his game. But as, as Murdo said, he's not the most creative player. He's got a job to do and he, he does his job well. So if you start talking, bringing other Celtic players into the equation, you know, there are a lot of other very, very skillful players. You know, I would say Paul McStay for one. Uh, who would be up there? Danny would be up there. You know what I mean? You could go yeah. on Lisbon Lions. You could go before that. So it, it depends where you want to stick him in there. You know, he is. He always be, will be a fantastic Celtic captain. Yeah. Just quickly, prediction scoreline for tonight. Two one. Two nothing. Okay. Um, coming up after the break, we'll look at all the other fixtures on the Tuesday night in the Champions League. Then we'll look ahead to tomorrow night's fixtures because, uh, quite simply, it could be a dominant two nights for English football in the Champions League. Just when we were trying to guess that year there, as soon as you said 1979, Murdo, I knew you were gone because that's one of my favourite FA Cup finals when Arsenal defeated Man United 3-2. <laughs> it's just the most outrageous cup final ever. Alan Sunderland. Yeah, uh, the yeah. year after it was Trevor Brooking and West Ham uh, winning the FA Cup by that solitary goal um, by uh, uh, defeating Arsenal. OK, that's 1980 was the year. What about the Champions League? Uh, of course, most of the matches will be uh, just about to kick off. Uh, let's have a look at Tuesday night fixtures and see where Celtic and and Anderlecht fit into this equation. Of course, Bayern Munich and Paris Saint-Germain. Um, Paris Saint-Germain's goal-scoring feats uh, have broken records uh, in the group stages, and they'll be in the Allianz Arena. I wonder if uh, they will get uh, a convincing win or whether Bayern Munich will maybe get a little bit of revenge on them. Elsewhere, Manchester United against CSKA Moscow, Benfica, FC Basel, and elsewhere tonight, it's Chelsea, Atletico Madrid, Roma, Carabag, Barcelona, Sporting Lisbon and Olympiacos against Juventus. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, of tonight's fixtures, uh, Manchester United, uh, they could have done it um, earlier, but they, yeah. they've got a chance tonight to uh, win the game and get ready for the knockout stages of the tournament. And Jose Mourinho already, there's talk that he could be given an £80 million kitty in the January transfer window. £80 million, yeah. Murdo. Well, that's the difference. You know, when you're looking at Jose having £80 million in Celtic, looking to play in the same competition, and yet whatever Celtic will spend, four or £5 million on a new centre-back or something like that. But it's just, just amazing that you know, he was given so much money. I think he spent more than anyone else. And uh, to be given that kind of budget, they can look anywhere in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and of course, the other thing about it is when we're thinking about picking Champions League winners, I mean, his pedigree is such roughy that, you know, I mean, I remember his Inter Milan side, nobody gave them a catch chance of winning mm -hmm. anything. And they oh. bored their way all the way to the final yeah. and, and ended up winning it. So I wonder why nobody's taking them seriously because they've been linked with a move for uh, Tottenham's Danny Rose at 50 million. Just gives you an indication of mm -hmm. how mad the whole market's gone but nobody's talking about Manchester United for the Champions League Yeah but I think they'll be quite happy with that you know I think obviously when you come under the radar you know and then obviously when it gets to the last 16 or whatever you see what kind of draw you've got but uh, that's what the, the English Premiership clubs do they, they attract managers with winning mentality who, who win European Cups or won Europa Cups and then yeah. you've got the Angelotti's, that's why they're all there, Ranieri's, you know, that's why they bring them, you know, they bring them because they've got a pedigree of winning trophies and uh, generally it <coughs> usually happens at yeah. some time or another. Yeah, are we not at the stage now that all the owners, there's one trophy they want to win and nothing else? Yeah. And just the Champions League. I think most of them now, they've they put so, money, so much money into each of these football clubs, especially in England. 
you know, all the money's going in there, and that's what I think that's what their, their target is going to be. Well, it's a good point that you make that, Murdo, because I think a lot of the other clubs with a rich history in European football are now resigned to the fact that they're saying to themselves, well, if we get Europa League, which I think is just a a poor tournament. I think it needs revamp. They've yeah. tried to give it a little bit of gloss with the appeal of a, a Champions League um, place for the winner of the tournament. But I still yeah. think, you know, is it because is it not appealing because it doesn't have as much money, or just because yeah. but it doesn't have the the real glamour ties? Yeah, I think that that's what everybody looks at just now, Peter. That <clears throat> when you look at the the group stages, everybody's not really interested in it. When you're getting two sides, it's not. You don't see them every every week, whereas in the Champions League, it's the best of the best, and everybody just wants to see them. And I think even more and more people, they're they're de delighted when they get to the last 16, even to the last eight, because it's all all the, the top class teams. You look at PSG just now. I think they lost at the weekend for the first time since all the money was put into the club. So now they've got a, a tough match tonight. But it'll be very interesting to see how they go and handle against one of the more experienced top class sides mm. um, just on that point who's your tip for the Champions League model <laughs> um, I, I think it's very very tough I think the English sides are very strong this year because normally by this time they're just about every one of them out of the tournament but uh, I think maybe Man City will will be hard to beat yeah uh, Man City's mine um, Ruffy's gone for PSG I just wonder if we're now at the point that English clubs will have a stranglehold on this tournament shortly because of the money. Well, that, that's what it's talking all the time is the, the money. All the English sides are getting so much money now put <coughs> into them and then you think that they, they're not good enough and then the next year they get another 80 million put into their football club. So when you start bringing in the best players around the world and you get them as a team, get them working as a team, then you've got a special team and that's that's why the English teams are going to be so strong. Yeah, uh, and of course, um, let's have a look at the Wednesday night fixtures because there's a particular tie I want to get your thoughts on. Um, here's how it looks on Wednesday. Liverpool, Spartak, Moscow. Uh, Liverpool probably go 3 nothing up and lose the lead. Um, Maribor against Seville. Feyenoord, Napoli. Shakhtar, Donetsk against Manchester City. And in the other group games, it's Porto, Monaco, Leipzig, Besiktas, Real Madrid, Borussia Dortmund and Tottenham against Apoel Nicosia. Just on that point, um, Borussia Dortmund, where where do you see your old side now in European standings? Is there, a, mm. is there the top clubs, Dortmunds in a second tier or third tier? Where? I think last season Dortmund were in with the top clubs. This year I think they've hit the wall. A uh, new manager came in and he got off to a decent start. Dortmund were five points ahead of... Uh, Bayern Munich, after, what, 12 games, now they're, they're about 15 points behind them. They, he's not won a game, He's I think he's drawn one in the last four. I went through to Dortmund for the Real Madrid game, and Dortmund had won 5 nothing at the weekend, so everybody was high, everybody thought, great. And I watched the game, and I just felt Real Madrid, because Dortmund, as you know, are an offensive side. They're slack at the back, they give away so many chances, but they score so many goals, they, they get by with it. But Real Madrid were the level above them that night because of the pace of Real Madrid, how hard they worked. Every single player in the team, it's not just a, a one-man team and you're thinking uh, Dortmund's have got an awful lot to do at home and I think it finished, it was it 3-1? Yeah. Game? Aye. And do you enjoy, I mean, obviously from a lot of people's perspective who might look and say, OK, there's Murdo and what he achieved at Celtic, what he achieved at Hibernian as well. Um, but, you know, having looked at a million and one pictures and in and, and, and the social media and, your, and a number of your, your family go back to Germany with you to Dortmund, mm. uh, they hold you in high esteem over there. You, you must have had some great times yeah. because of the affection that's shown to you. Yeah, I really enjoy going back there and it's a fantastic football club. Great atmosphere in the ground. I'm sure a lot of people, when they watch the games, they would love to be just go in and just go for a game and so many people ask me how do you go over to Dortmund how do you get to the games and all that kind of thing and I, I love going over myself I went to the, the new training ground they've just built a new training ground and spent about uh, 25 million on it so you know the new pitches the best of gear for everyone the, the young sides or the young players the local players that 
but they bring in so many players from abroad as well, so they've got great talent, young talent coming through. Do you think that's a key to you than the type of player? Were you a better player for your experiences at Dortmund? What was the one discipline that changed your mindset? We look here uh, about you know copying people, taking little bits to try and get us back on a, some yeah. kind of standing in football. Uh, I reckon what you would have learned uh, in German football is something that I think professional footballers, I always say to Rafi in this programme, to make it to the absolute top, some of our youngsters need to work even harder on their technical ability. Yeah. Spend more hours on this, put in more work to get it to the absolute top. Yeah, I think when, when I went over there at first, it's the way they played the game. You know, I was a midfield player at box to box, defended reasonably well, scored a few goals going the other way, battled in the middle of the park, whereas the Germans at that time, everyone had the, the, the way we played just now. No, you're a sitting midfield player, you just sit in there and make passes. You've got an offensive midfield, midfield player who would go forward. If you've got the ball and it's tight, don't give the ball away. We used to try and just knock the ball over the top and then go and squeeze the opposition in. Whereas the Germans wouldn't do that, they would bring the ball back out of the situation and then pass it around the team again and then go forward. They, they tried to not give the ball away. Yeah. Uh, and that's one thing I always felt when I came back, that uh, when I went to Hibs, all the time, I'd always say to players, don't give the ball away, keep the ball, no matter what, keep the ball. Yeah, but, but was was that laced with also, if you have talent, being allowed to express yourself? 100%. No, yeah, because no one's going to shout at a player who's trying to get by a defender to create an opportunity. That's that's what they want, but when you're, when you're in the middle of the park and you've got the defence in front of you, the midfielder in front of you, don't give it away. Yeah. And if you keep the ball that, and then you can gradually pull the opposition players out, and then it starts making spaces in between the defenders, the midfield players, and then you can start just, your offensive midfield player then can create a wee bit of problems for the defenders. Yeah. Have you got a painting up there in, in, in Germany, in, in the stadium somewhere, have you? There's a picture up in the wall. Yeah, I'm happy with that. There's a picture up on the wall at Verhill uh, of Ruffy. Um, you've got to see it to believe it. Um, it's just absolutely <laughs> magnificent, Murdo. I advise you to go and see it. Fantastic. You, need to, use your, you yeah. need to use your imagination yeah. when somebody says that's Ruffy. Uh, anyway, <laughs> on, uh, on that note, uh, we're going to be back talking about Austin McPhee and Craig Levine next. Join us if you can. Did you get that, Ruffy? Yeah. Yeah, happy with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's in my all-time world 11. Not Ruffy. Uh, Gerd, uh, <laughs> Gerd Muller. Yeah. Um, fantastic striker, Murdo. Unbelievable. No, always on the go. Always just looking for a wee half chance and scored so many goals, different angles, always there. And just holding the ball up as well because you looked at the size of the centre-backs he played against. And he still caused him so many problems. Yeah, if you to look at the stats on his goal scoring for club and country, it would frighten the life out of you, Ruffy. Unbelievable mm. the amount of goals he scored. Yeah, he played in good good sides as well. But uh, if you ever, as you were saying there, get a chance at anything in the eighteen yard box, then where yeah. he was, you know, he was always there. And if you're if you've got somebody like that in your team, and you know, there's maybe the goalkeeper's not going to save, he's not going to hold on to it or something. These kind of predators are just yeah. lurking and he scored, about. He scored at all yeah. levels yeah. as well, Alan. Mm -hmm. no, the, the World Cup for his country and the the, the, the European yeah. Cup. He yeah. scored in there. Yeah. He scored in all the tournaments. Yeah. The one, the one he scored in '74, just just standing with his back to the goal and then just swiveling and turn. Yeah. turn. That was just typical of everything he did. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Uh, we're going to move on now to something that um, has left me more than a little surprised. That Ruffy Rangers are going to appeal. Ryan Jack's uh, red card. Um, what's your take on it? I'd love to know the grounds. I'd love to know wh why they think that uh, he's got a chance of getting off with it. I know he's got off with it a, a couple of times when I, def I honestly thought he would have been 
obviously done then as well, but he never got off with them. But uh, it depends. I mean, I was talking to a couple of referees that they, obviously the two clubs are now going in with with lawyers and yeah. you know, and it becomes more of a you know what's like a court case. A technical you know, thing. no, no, you, the technicality. That's what I was trying to get. Technicality is what they're getting off with, not for what they've actually done. It's. Yeah. You know, but whatever way it's worded or whatever, and and, and I've said this on numerous occasions. I, I think the people uh, at the end of this are the referees, who are refereeing the game with the best interest. They're filing a report, they're sending, and then they're going up into these tribunals, and it's getting thrown out. And if I was a referee, I'd be, I'd be. I think it'd be frightening referees away from getting to the top. I, you know, I, I think Alan, of these decisions that you're not getting. It's really difficult just now, when. For a referee, because you watch some of the challenges and you think that's a tough challenge, then you see it repeated <coughs> in the television, yeah. and then you think, no, that's a shocking challenge. That's a leg breaker. Yeah, I mean, as you can see it now. I mean, what's your take on it, uh, Murdo? When you have a look at it again, I, I just can't believe it. I mean, Wally, Wally Collum for me calls it spot on. Yeah, I, I think it was right because a lot of people will say he's got the ball first, but he's carried right through. And it, I think that, that that's a sending off offence of, of you know, the, the aggression that goes into the challenge. Because you can go up and get the ball and pass it. He could have passed the ball away there, but he's passed the ball and he's been, he followed right through and he's caught, could have broke, broke his leg. Yeah, I and think that, that boy, Stevie May, especially off the, um, the back of the injuries that yeah. he's, he, he's come back off. I mean, yeah. you could tell right away he was trying to play through it. Um, but in the end, he had to succumb to, uh, as Derek McInnes mentioned, the fluid in his, in his leg. Yeah. He just had to come off. But, yeah, I, I'm curious about this one. I mean, I don't think yeah. the referee will change his mind on it. No, I don't think the referee at all will change his mind. And especially, as I touched on there, seeing it in the camera, the challenge there, it's, it's quite tight together. He's, he's, he's knocked the ball away. He's continued right through this. It's all the foot and it's, it's into the side of his leg. You just thought it was a tough challenge. But when you see it in slow motion, you think... That is a leg breaker. So more and more people will get in the side of uh, Stevie May to say it's you no know, that, that that was a shocking challenge. Yeah. Uh, in the end, Ruffy, prior to that, he's a boy that I, I, I still think the Rangers fans have to see the best of. I've seen nothing to suggest um, that you know he was going to set the head on fire over a, a number mm -hmm. of weeks. It was all about the negatives of red cards, mm -hmm. and then slowly but surely, in the last couple of weeks, I've started to see signs of. The Ryan Jack that you know maybe has got mm. the potential to go on to become a an influential midfielder, but again, it's always he never seems to be able to get that, mm. you know, that real kickstart to his time at Rangers. Well, I think unfortunately he's fallen into the category of of a lot of really good players for other teams in the in the league coming to Rangers or Celtic and struggling to establish himself you know yeah. that might be the pressure of playing in front of 50,000 people it might be the pressure of Rangers not winning as, as many as they should and it's all fallen on well he'll think it's fallen on to him so maybe he's, he needs to be the kind of guy that Rangers go on a wee run then you start seeing the best of him because I think we all know that he has got uh, some quality in there and uh, but I think really it's all about adapting to where he is now rather than Aberdeen yeah, um, of course, uh, Rangers fans will not be uh, too much involved in the, the the red card appeal. They'll all be thinking about the new manager and when he's coming. It's it's this constant drag uh, on whether Derek McInnes, whether they can come up with the money, whether Derek McInnes, I think the biggest dilemma uh, after Rangers make their approach is Derek McInnes asking himself some serious questions, Murdo, um, about being the manager of Rangers at a time when the remit is quite simply stop 10 in a row. Yeah, That's the next three years of that deal. It's a really strange one for Derek McInnes, Peter. So Rangers sacked their manager, what, six weeks ago? And the name that came out from every newspaper was Derek McInnes. And he, he, no one got in touch with him. And six weeks later, now everybody's saying, oh, it's Derek McInnes, it's going to get in announced next week yeah. so the whole thing so he's went five weeks nearly six weeks that Rangers haven't been in touch with him now all of a sudden if, they, if the board changed their mind and thought we can't get anyone else so we're just going to go and get you surely if Rangers wanted Derry McInnes you got to be at the bottom because the talk before Kashinia arrived was Derek McInnes and now here we are again as soon as they get rid of the manager they should have went for Derek McInnes right away. Yeah. It made him feel very welcome to the football club. Not waiting to see his 
wait, what, wait, we'll see what's going to happen. Now Aberdeen fans are beginning to turn in Derek McInnes, you know, ah, he's just, he's not working as hard because the two Rangers games and all that, that's giving Rangers strength, oh, that's this kind of stuff. Yeah. So Derek, Derek's been fantastic for Aberdeen, and yet if he walks away and goes to Rangers, then all the Aberdeen fans turn against him. Yeah, oh, I mean, whatever he achieved at... Um uh, Petaudry is forgotten if he joins Rangers. Uh, if he joins Rangers for me, Ruffy, the big question is, what's the budget? What's the investment? Mm -hmm. How much am I getting to try and get Rangers, first of all, bypassing Aberdeen and then challenging Celtic? Well, I've already said that I think the players at, uh, at Rangers' disposal, <coughs> uh, and not counting the ones that are injured, obviously Wallace, Dorns, whoever you bring in in January, uh, should be good enough to be second in that league and I think if you go there as the manager you know your remit will be obviously keep Celtic within reach I don't think the, the, the board would expect a new manager to do anything else get us into Europe you know which I'm sure the fans would love and then build on that you know and I think Derek uh, or any other manager would see that as a challenge and uh, but again you know it depends how attractive the pool is to go to Rangers with everything that's happening. Yeah, OK, um, this will undoubtedly drag on. Um, one thing that's been quickly nipped in the bud is Austin McPhee and Craig Levine. They'll not get any further punishment for the altercations at the weekend. I, I, I did think it was funny, Murdo, watching yeah. the whole situation. Um, I mean, yeah. this one is just yeah. Craig Levine being Craig Levine. Yeah. Um, the other one uh, is... Uh, farcical to say the least I mean this happens all the time in the game and uh, there you go <laughs> <laughs> brilliant that is great uh, I mean both of them escape punish there's nothing in it really to be honest no there, there's nothing in it there it's just that happens so often with, with man, uh, managers and assistant managers but Craig Levine maybe just wanting a wee chance to sit in the new stand he's maybe you know <coughs> sat down there yet but I think that he's only four rows behind but it's very unusual seeing the manager and the assistant manager been sent to the stand, but it's. I think they've they've done it quickly and get it solved quickly. And In a strange sort of way, though, it's deflected away from the fact that this team is not firing in all cylinders, Ruffy. This team needs an injection of quality mm -hmm. in it. I think mm -hmm. it needs. I think it needs a bit of flair. It's lacking flair. I mean, he's mentioned in the last month, you know, that it needs, you know, he wants to play with wide men and yeah. as usual get a new the left ball back. Into, he wants a new left back. Yeah, a new left back, back and he wants pace and he wants a bit of flair there as well. It's sadly lacking it. Mm -hmm. It's that whole altercation and Bobby Madden has deflected away from the fact that they just mm -hmm. haven't been able to get a win. No, and the stats are there for the, the heart supporters to see. Uh, and I know they are very, very loyal. But there comes a time, you know, when you start asking questions and I don't think we're too far away from that. Obviously, we've got some Hibs games yeah. coming up. What, what questions? I mean, you're not seriously thinking you start asking questions about the manager. He's only just in the job. No, but they'll start, you know, asking sort of, a, you know, mm -hmm. where are we going? What yeah. are we doing? What, what, how are you going to turn this round? What kind of players are we? Have we got a budget? Have we got money to spend? You know, and that's what happens when you don't get results. But as I said, I think the Hibs Hearts game will just bring that to, uh, <laughs> to the front. <laughs> you can tell Ruffy's trying to get on the Crystal Palace board. <laughs> you know, let's bump him after six games, yeah. Murdo. Nice you wouldn't have had a chance yeah. at him no. if he'd have been on the board. Oh, I know. No, 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 I'd be interested <laughs> to see if Craig's actually enjoying it. Yeah. You know, he obviously took the job of director of football and uh, and he was very good at that because everything was getting done. You know, yeah. I'd be interested to see if he is... Uh, Happy being back yeah. in the front, you know, from where he sort of was in the background. Yeah. Well, that was his decision, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think, he, I mean, think he was forced in it a wee bit. I don't think, I think no, he was, you're never forced No, no, I mean, like but that. you were asked. No. Uh, yeah. I think Anne yeah. asked him, could you do it? Yeah. You know, and well, to be fair, every man there's, there's always another answer of no. Really. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? That's the other one. Mm -hmm. But then ego would kick in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and of course, the other thing about it is every manager loves the job when they're winning. It's as simple as that. Um, we'll be back with uh, more Football Chat after this next teaser question. <laughs> 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 
fucking, look at the two, you like two kids there. Man. I mean, I had, I don't know why, but I just had a mind blank, no chance on that. You two yeah. nailed it. 1998. I didn't think it was that early for Fat Boy Slim either. Never yeah. mind uh, him being relegated. But yep, you two, you were on the mark. 1998. High as a kite about it as well. Um, and by the looks of your faces, um, let's talk about some of the other teams uh, in the uh, Premier League uh, that obviously have different expectations. Uh, Ross County, Owen Coyle's come in. How do you think he's fared so far since he came in at Ross County, Murdo? I think uh, performances on the pitch have, have been better, but the results haven't been better. Because obviously now, dropping into the second bottom, you know, it's a really tough one for them. You know, the chairman will be a wee bit gutted because I think when he brought in Owen Coyle, you know, that's a big, big signing for a, a manager who's been in the Premier League in England and you no know, great uh, reputation and it's not worked. But again, I think it'll all start easing out a wee bit when he gets some money in January and brings in some some players that he needs. Yeah, see, that's the key. And as you know, Roy McGregor always backs the manager in the mm -hmm. January transfer window, Ruffy. Yeah, and I think if he, if he looks at the stats and what's happening, I think he will. You know, And obviously, if you're a Ross County supporter, you'll be interested in what kind of player Owen's going to going to bring, mm. you know, he's obviously brought the boy Eagles up, uh, who's obviously worked with down there, and I'm sure there'll be two or three others uh, yeah. with, with that kind of experience, but for me, Ross County, I think he'll go up there, he'll get them organised, but for me, you just have to look at the goal scoring, Boyce and Curran, you know, kept them where they were, you know, and the amount of goals that they scored, and obviously Boyce isn't there anymore, Curran isn't maybe not scoring because his partner's not there. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what team you're at. You know, if you're, you've got two guys who are regularly digging in and scoring goals, you take them out of the equation. Same happened with Dundee when they lost to yeah. uh, Stewart. It's a hard, hard one to fill, you know, so maybe that's what he has to bring in. Yeah, and of course it doesn't get any easier for Ross County. They're at Ibrox on Saturday. Here's the manager's take on the forthcoming fixture against a team that may well have a new manager. Obviously, the last two games back to back against Aberdeen have been terrific, and I think Graham Murphy deserves enormous credit for how he's conducted himself and and really stepping in after uh, Pedro left, and he's he's shown that he has great capabilities and great attributes. So enormous credit to him. So whether it's Graham Murphy or whether it's a new appointment, time will tell. We just have to focus on Ross County and make sure we're the very best of what we can be. And if we do that, we're sure we can stand toe to toe with the best teams. It was interesting to get uh, the Ross County manager's take on whether he thinks there's progress. We, we never get the job because Ross County were, were at the top end of the league. There was a lot of work to be done, there was a reason for it. And that's what we have to make sure that we're looking to, to improve and pick up and, uh, and carry on. As I said before, a lot of good work had been done previously, but knowing, obviously, as we had to win games and address that. So we did that, but now again, in this period, it's important we pick our points up moving into, obviously, January. Uh, when, like anybody else, we'll look at what's available and see if there's players that can help the squad we have. Yep, uh, so he's obviously uh, had a chat with uh, the manager and uh, he's had a chat with the chairman, I beg your pardon, to see if they can get out of that second bottom position. I still have them. I had tipped Hamilton mm -hmm. for relegation, Ruffy, and I had Ross County in there mm -hmm. as a uh, playoff specialist. I, I think the five teams that are there just now will be the five teams that will be fighting it out right for the, the season. I don't think any of them have shown any signs uh, getting into that top six. Not even Dundee? No, I know they've won a couple of games, but they, obviously if they start winning games with these teams that they're playing round about there, yet yeah, they've got a chance. But I, I think St Johnson will still be hanging about that six-point place. Yeah. Murdo? Yeah, I think St Johnson just having a bad spell just now, but I think they'll, they'll gradually get better and I think that they're a well-organised uh, club and I think they, they'll be comfortable, but I think the team's all down the bottom. But this will now, they're under a wee bit more pressure. Because before it was always a point in it, or the same points at the bottom of the table. Now they're, they're drifting a wee bit behind and the, the ones above them are winning games. So if you start winning games, you can go on a wee run, three or four in a, a row. If you're playing the sides round about you, you can get up towards it, the, the top half of the table. But you're c comfortable. Yeah. Whereas this will just now can't buy a win. Who's your relegation and playoff tip? Relegation. Um, Okay, every every year is, is Hamilton Nackies. <laughs> every year, and I, I take my hat off to them. I take my hat off to them, and uh, they're there to. I think that that helps them, because all the pundits who go on television and newspapers, and the first 
tip is Hamilton to go down. Yeah. And I think that's great inspiration. So they'll not mind me VAR. That's the inspiration for them. Because um, I, I think that the clubs, financially, we always say clubs with money will be able to bring in better players. But Hamilton just seem to bring in players maybe for nothing. But they do a great job for them. Yeah. And he managed to get gets a Hamilton type player to play for the club. Yeah. Should that not influence us to change our minds on this? Because the amount of people who say to me, wait a minute, <clears throat> they may well not have a spend, but they have a blueprint of giving young Scottish talent their chance. Yeah. And that, that, that's a fantastic way to, to run a football club. And if it works, and e even the Hamilton fans have been shouting against the manager over the, the last couple of seasons and it's not it's not been great yeah. and he's managed to keep that club up <coughs> which is a fantastic achievement but you, you look at going to you know, no Hamilton sides went there in the, the league to Ibrox and for 90 odd years and they've went there and won now that's a fantastic achievement to do that yeah so he's managed to do all these kind of things so I think the club themselves the, the supporters have got to get behind the manager couple of things I want to get your thoughts on, guys, before you finish. One of them's um, both of you played uh, for Hibernian. Good piece in the evening news just talking about Darren McGregor being back, Ruffy. I think he's going to be a huge player uh, for Neil Lennon the second part of the season if he can uh, steer clear of injury. Yeah, I, I was absolutely gobsmacked when Rangers <coughs> let him go uh, and obviously Hibs have been there and taken him. I think he's been a fantastic leader until obviously he's picked up these injuries and... Uh, and that just shows how Neil's done so well because obviously Fontaine's it as well, you know, and they're two big players. But he's back now and you can see at the weekend that he's got pace, you know, he's got recovery yeah. for a centre half, you know, and he's dominant. I think there was a, a big game at Hamden, I think he sort of won single handedly, and that's what kind of guy he is. So, no, I think he'll be a big, big player in the running. Yeah, I think he's a, a top class player and I think he's, he'll be great for the club if he stays fit. And that's the only problem, if he stays fit. He'll be in there every week, and especially coming back, and if he's ready for the, the weekend, it's going to be a, a tough game to come back to play in. Yeah, do you see Hibs challenging for... I have them top three. I uh, thought they would be up there. Um, the manager's slowly but surely chipping away at the yeah. mentality. I think they're top three. Yeah, I think he's, Neil's the type of manager, though. It's a wee bit old-fashioned as well. You know, the way he played football, that's the way he wants his team to play. You know, a wee bit of aggression about them, and... No, he's got quality players in there, so I, I think Hibs will not be far away this year. Obviously, not at the, the, the number one spot, but yeah. I think you, you're, they're looking at uh, second and third, fourth. I think I think they would accept second, third, or fourth. The way because remember that's the team that came up from uh, the championship last year. You no, know, to come up and do so well. It was a great achievement. Yeah, OK. Uh, just to finish, lads, this obviously uh, may well divide you on which camp you fall into, but Thursday it'll be time to hand out uh, yet another Ballon d'Or. Um, this time, if Ronaldo wins it, he equals Messi's tally of uh, five. Um, I mean, Messi's just absolutely sensational as a player. Uh, I think all the purists love what he can, what he can do on the ball, creating, scoring goals... The other man for me is, uh, you know, he's he's won me over because I think his application to his profession, you know, this is a guy who just has worked harder and harder and harder, you know, love him or loathe him yeah. for his diving antics at time yeah. and his gesticulating. I mean, he is an absolute showman. But I, th I think for his sport and where he is in the sport over the last few years, and he still has that target he wants to do well every year he doesn't sit back he doesn't think oh look who I am look what I've achieved he works hard all the time and see these people they deserve the big money they get the wages they get and there's so many people just live off them yeah. because he's pulling the wage bracket up to for everyone else but I think he's fantastic yeah. I th honestly I do I, I watched it he, he played in Dortmund and honestly the pace and the, the skill and the, the, the first touch you could watch him all day. Yeah, and, and this is a, a man that we're writing off a couple of seasons ago because he was playing the number seven role and suddenly mm -hmm. they moved him to the number nine role, Ruffy, and it was like a new lease of life again. I mean, if the statistics could have been broken, there you are, mm -hmm. there's the evidence. Yeah, I think you just have to look at the goals. 
you know, I mean, they're, they're fantastic. They're no tap-ins. They're, yeah. they're either spectacular, you know, overheads or whatever. And I, I don't, we don't seem to be talking about Messi as much. And I don't know what it is, no. whether it's Barcelona yeah. and the, the heights they were at. But uh, I don't know, he's still got something to offer as well. Yep. Yeah. OK, then. Um, are you a Messi or a Ronaldo? No, Des told me not to vote for Ronaldo. OK. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you Messi or Ronaldo just in the long... <laughs> I like both of them. No, that's fine, mm. that's fine. That's I'm in great. the middle, but they're two special players. Yeah, absolutely. I like your attitude, Murdo. Let's celebrate having both of them rather than isolate just one of them. Uh, good attitude. Great to have Murdo on. Always uh, adds a bit of solidity to the midfield on this programme. <laughs> uh, we lost him for a wee while there, and then we just dragged him back in when he thought he was uh, going to be lost to the programme. Uh, join us tomorrow on the programme. We've got a different style of midfielder. Barry Ferguson is our bootroom guest on the Wednesday. Uh, Join us, if you can, STV2 at half past seven. From Murdo, from Ruffy and myself, Peter Martin. Good night.